Avatar The Last Airbender is the greatest animated series of all time and it has a fantastic follow-up sequel series with Avatar The Legend of Korra. All seven seasons of Avatar are well made and there's no bad season in here. So let's rank all seven seasons of Avatar The Last Airbender and Avatar The Legend of Korra from worst to the best. Hello and welcome to Cinemaze and let's get right into the ranking. Number 7, The Legend of Korra, Book 2, Spirits. Coming in last place is The Legend of Korra Season 2. As I said, there's no bad season of this show, this is still well made and highly enjoyable, but one of them has to come in last place and I think Korra Season 2 is the weakest of all the seasons. Starting with the good, this series is strongest when dealing with the lore and history of the world. This season does so well to flesh out the background of the spirits of Bending and of the Avatar. It gives us a beautifully animated two-part episode looking at the origin of the Avatar and it's done so well. It's often hard to give backstory five seasons into a universe. It normally would feel forced or doesn't make sense or it undoes information we previously knew. However here, the backstory they give is so strong, it feels like it was always planned out from the start and it doesn't feel forced or made up along the way. It actually helps to flesh out one of the criticisms of The Last Airbender by giving further history of the Lion Turtles, which got criticised in season 3 of the original show. We're also introduced to some great new characters like Varric, Julie and Boomy, while meeting some familiar faces along the way. But this season has some big issues. It's bogged down by some of the worst romances in the show, with Bolin entering a forced, abusive relationship with Eska and it's played for laughs, while Korra forgets her breakup with Mako while Mako dates Asami. It feels like a sitcom and it feels unnecessary to the full story. It makes it seem like the writers weren't sure where the romantic plots were going to go. Also, Bolin doesn't have much to do, he's on a side plot about becoming a movie star. Yes, it's funny, but it does feel like they didn't know what to do with him, so they just sent him off on a side quest. But the biggest problem with this season is the villain Unalak. He's a pretty generic villain who isn't very interesting and his motivation doesn't make much sense. He just loves spirits for some reason, that's why he does what he does. Well the idea of a dark avatar is super interesting, it just leads to a big avatar spirit fight which feels like it came out of nowhere, I don't get what's going on or how it happened and it doesn't make much sense. Avatar is interesting for its unique bending fight, not giant spirits punching each other. This is the animated equivalent of a giant CGI fight at the end of a superhero film that I would normally criticise. Overall this season is best when expanding the history and lore of the world and the avatar but weakest when pushing the story forward forwards to Korra and her friends. Number 6, The Legend of Korra Book 4, Balance. Next is The Legend of Korra Season 4, which I think is a big improvement over Book 2 because it does push the characters forwards in an interesting direction. Ultimately, the biggest problem with this season for me is again the villain Kavira. Kavira is presented as this stoic, well-trained woman who wants to unite the Earth Kingdom under her regime. She's presented to the audience like we're supposed to understand where she's coming from, but I don't think that translates at all. She is clearly a dictator and she's clearly in the wrong, so all the sympathy I'm supposed to feel is lost. I was actually fortunate enough to meet Janet Varney, the voice actress of Korra, at London Comic Con this year and I asked her who her favourite Korra villain was and she said Kavira because she said Kavira represents Korra and who Korra could have become. A very strong-willed, powerful woman, but again, I don't think that translates to the final project. I don't feel like she's this dark reflection of Korra. She's pretty boring and she's clearly evil. Apparently there was a budget cut and an episode focusing on Kavira's backstory was replaced with a clip show episode. Maybe adding in this episode would have helped. Ultimately, Kavira doesn't really work for me and that does dampen this whole season. To make her a threat to Korra, they have to nerf Korra down and make her less powerful. While this does a lot of good for Korra's character arc, it does make the action and the threat weaker. That said, this is an effective finale season. Mainly this works because of that arc Korra is on. Seeing her at the start of the season as a broken character, seeing how far she's come from that naive and optimistic avatar from season 1, then seeing her climb out of her dark place to save the day is a very effective and mature character arc that handles mental health really well. While Korra and Asami's relationship could have had more build up, I appreciate the sentiment and the restrictions they had at the time. And ultimately, this is a successful finale season. Number five, The Legend of Korra, book one, Air. The first season of The Legend of Korra is really good. I actually think it gets overlooked. It does everything a first season needs to do. It reintroduces us to the world, it makes us care about the characters, and it gets us invested in the story. And it does all of that really well. This time, we have a fantastic villain in Amon, who I think is really effective and represents a very realistic issue of how non-benders would feel in a city like this. The writers also smartly knew that fans of the original show were now older, and so we have older characters and a much more mature 
pure story and I appreciate that a lot. The new team avatar is good but I think the more interesting characters are the supporting cast like Tenzin and Lin Beifong. While I do prefer the less technologically advanced time setting of The Last Airbender, I understand they needed to change things up. So this time we have a more advanced steampunk vibe and a fantastic location in Republic City. We're also introduced to the sport of pro bending which was super fun. While it would have been nice to see more of the past characters, I appreciate that the writers wanted to push the story forwards rather than look back and didn't want us to rely on nostalgia. And they really did create a new story here and it does so successfully. Number four, Avatar The Last Airbender Book One, Water. Much like Book One of Korra, the first season of The Last Airbender does everything that a first season needs to do and it does so to perfection. It introduces us to fun, new, unique characters that we care about. It gets us invested in the world and the bending and it sets up a story that is interesting and it does it all so well and it does it effortlessly. While those first few seasons of Korra are very standalone, Season one of Aang really sets up the three seasons so well, with hints towards Sozin's comets, towards Azula and towards Zuko's redemption. While re-watching this season, I had forgotten how much time is given in season one to Zuko. Most episodes have half the story focused on him, showing they knew this character was more than just a villain from the start. While there are some darker episodes in here, like a surprisingly dark third episode where Aang finds out what happened to his people, or the storm where we learn about Zuko's past and his father, most of this season is on the more light-hearted side. And this is certainly the most child-friendly season, and that does hold this season back a bit. I was really debating whether I preferred book one of Korra or Aang more, because I do appreciate the more mature tone of Korra, but ultimately, I chose season one of Aang because of the characters. All the main characters in Aang's team avatar are far more interesting and endearing than the main characters in Korra. And so it's that character work that puts it above Korra's first season. Overall, season one of The Last Airbender is a masterclass in world building, character introduction and story setup. And it only gets better from here. Number three, Avatar The Last Airbender, book two, Earth. When it comes to sequels, a common mistake that films and series make is going bigger. Bigger means better, right? Well, season two of The Last Airbender shows us how to do better and bigger in a way that feels natural. We have more characters, we have bigger action, we have higher stakes and a more mature story. And it all works. While we still have some filler episodes in here, they tend to do some great character work, giving us emotional and mature episodes, like Zuko Alone, The Tales of Bar Sing Se, and Upper's Lost Days. We learn more about the world, bending, and continue to set up the finale, and it all feels subtle and natural. We also continue to set up Zuko's redemption, having him no longer as the villain, but living a life in exile with his uncle, which really gives the season an emotional core. Replacing Zuko is Azula as the main villain in this season, and she is fantastic. She's creepy, powerful, manipulative, and another perfect voice actor in the role. We also meet Toph as Aang's earthbending teacher and she fits into this show so well. It's often hard to introduce a character in a later season and make them fit into the core cast, but it's crazy to think there was a whole season of this show without Toph or Azula in it because they both feel so fundamental to the characters here. The action and bending is even better this time around, feeling more fluid and exhilarating, while continuing to expand the law of bending with metal bending, lightning redirection, and chakras. The latter half of this season is really where it stops feeling like an episodic children's show and becomes even more engaging and intense, and you immediately want to watch the next episode. And then it ends like Empire Strikes Back with a more mature, fantastic cliffhanger, where the good guys lose and you have to wait to the next season to see where it leads. There's actually a few similarities to Empire in here with our main character, going off to train with an eccentric master, leaving because he sees a vision of his friends in trouble, and then getting defeated and having to escape. Overall, I don't really have any criticisms for this season. It does everything it needs to do. Number two, The Legend of Korra, book three, change. Coming in at second place is The Legend of Korra season three, which really is where Korra peaks. This show does a lot right, which other seasons of Korra weren't as successful at. This time we keep Team Avatar together, and it's the most interesting that these characters ever are. We aren't sending Mako off on a side quest working with the police or protecting the Earth King. We aren't having Bo Lin waste time on a train or making movies. No, this time Team Avatar feel like a team and they're front and center and it makes them far more interesting. We aren't wasting time on romances which lead nowhere. Instead, we're dedicating that time to the villain and the plot. We focus on the direct actions of Korra from season two, leaving the spirit portals open, a decision she made which the world isn't necessarily happy with, but it leads to airbenders returning. And that's a massive moment for the show and the fans, considering this all started with the last airbender. That gives a really emotional heart to this season 
as we see the new airbenders appear, what this means to Tenzin and trying to find their place in the world. We also have the best villain of Korra with Zaheer and the Red Lotus. While his motivations aren't as sympathetic as Amon, this villain is great because he's a threat directly clashing with the Avatar. Because Bending has developed so much by this point, he is a physical threat for Korra even when she's at full power. The action here is fantastic, like Zaheer and Korra's final battle or Tenzin single-handedly taking on the Red Lotus. And we have all these fantastic new Bending abilities which leads to unique moments. And this show continues to expand the lore and bending powers, this time using it to service the character's arcs, with the ability to fly capping off Zaheer's story, with lava bending finishing Bolin's arc, and with the airbenders working together to save the day. And this time, yes, our heroes win, but it leaves Korra broken and depressed. And that's an interesting way to end a third season. It's not a giant cliffhanger, the good guys won, but in the process, Korra's mind was defeated. And again, this continues the trend of Korra being a much more mature show. The characters are the best they've ever been. It has unique moments and mature storytelling, we get fantastic action and we continue to expand the world and the lore. This season is incredible, but it's not number one. Number one, Avatar The Last Airbender, book three, Fire. In our top spot is the final season of Avatar The Last Airbender, giving us a satisfying series finale which lives up to its build-up. The season starts with a few filler episodes as we await the day of Black Sun, and typically you wouldn't expect filler to kick off your final season, but here it works. The filler episodes take time to dedicate some final character moments to our heroes before we cap off their stories. Each member of Team Avatar gets a final episode, with Aang getting a final chance to be a child. Sokka feels inadequate as a non-bender so he becomes a master the swordsman and Katara helps out a village and becomes a bloodbender and that's an absolute standout episode. I think taking this time away from the story and focusing on characters was a really smart move coming into our finale. While all this is going on, Zuko's redemption is getting paid off. They make the smart choice of giving him everything he thought he wanted before redeeming him. Having him realize that he's not the same person anymore makes his redemption all the more satisfying. Zuko gets redeemed and it's so satisfying. It's not done in the last episode rushing it. No, it's done halfway through. And then we really give him a life-changing adventure with our heroes to make him fit into Team Avatar. By this stage, all of our heroes are bending masters so the action here has gotten even better. The day of the Black Sun invasion and the final action scene with an animated 360 degrees camera were incredible for the time and they still hold up to this day. Unlike Korra, you can tell that the budget remained all the way through to the end. This all leads to the four part season finale of Sozin's Comet and it's got everything you want. Action, emotion, payoff and character moments. Everyone has an emotional arc which ends in a way that feels right. From Azula's breakdown to Zuko becoming Fire Lord to Aang finding a way to save the day without killing to Iroh opening a tea shop. It all works so well. There's a few criticisms I do have about this season. The Fire Lord isn't the best villain, he could have had more focus and the Lion Turtle came out of nowhere. With no setup it really does feel like a deus ex machina but it doesn't take away from how satisfying this conclusion is. How many times have you watched a season finale and been disappointed after years of enjoying the show? Well even when it's good they often forget to focus on certain elements that they'd previously set up. Well this season finale doesn't do that. It gives us a final season which pays off all the arcs. It lives up to the hype and concludes the show in a satisfying way that makes sense for the world and characters. It's that conclusion and payoff that puts the final season of Avatar The Last Airbender at number one. So that's my ranking of all seven seasons of the Avatarverse. As I said, these are all great seasons and none of them are bad. What did you think of my ranking and how would you rank them? Let me know in the comments down below. I hope you enjoyed this ranking. If you did, please like the video. It helps me out so much. And be sure to subscribe because I release new videos every Friday talking about Avatar, Marvel, DC, Star Wars. But for now, thanks for watching. Cinemate.